A reading from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Let us give glory to God. Glory to God. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty sand windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How could this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, and Egypt, and areas of Libya, around Syria, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we hear all these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others, <coughs> but others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying they're drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions, and your old will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood, and fire, clouds, and smoke. Then the sun will become dark, and the moon will turn blood red, before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is Holy Scripture. Praise, Praise to thee, Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you see it's all right. You're waiting to see it. Here they were celebrating Pentecost. This was the end of the harvest, of the spring harvest. And it's one of the three main festivals that they were encouraged, or really, to be a devout Jewish person, that you had to be at. You had to make the sacrifices. You had to make a pilgrimage uh, to Jerusalem, or at least to the local temple or synagogue that's closest to you. This was a big deal. So that's why they had people from all of the other countries there. They were all being there for this big deal. They had just came for Passover 50 days before, and Pentecost means that 50 days later, when they celebrate the end of the harvest. This was a re religious and a national celebration. And it kind of reminds me, and it's, and it's not often that Pentecost falls in June. Um, we had a late Easter, and then Pentecost falls in June, and it happens to fall during Gay Pride Month. I'm sorry, folks. I, it is hard to... <laughs> I'm fine, and I take a... I take a throat washer, and I had that just before, and I'm talking all fine, and I, I guess it's my singing. Maybe I should stop singing. And, uh, and uh, I, I want to get in with our singing of the day, and, and then I, I guess I'll wear myself out <clears throat> beforehand. Apologize for that. But we have our gay pride, so now we have Pentecost during gay pride, and it reminds me of this, this celebration, if you will, that we have, this, this activities that we have, but, but we have to think about what happened, what the beginning of what we understand of our gay pride today started at Stonewall.
started as a riot when they were being harassed and, and pressured by the police and falsely arrested and, and, uh, and, and the, the police were harassing and hurting people and so they fought back and they stood back and it was actually a riot. And we've gone for a long time now, this past little period, a fairly little bit of rest. We, we've had our gay prides and churches can walk and, and P-Flag can walk and, and, and different groups and you may have walked before with some group that you're a part of or your business and lots of people celebrate it. And I, I've gone to banks and, I, and I've gone to a teller bank one time at a drive through bank and, and it said that this particular bank was celebrating gay pride. In fact, I heard just recently that Macy's, Macy's had a commercial that was celebrating a special cell around LGBTQ and it said how they were supportive and, and, and supporting a pride events and, and the things. And guess where I heard that Macy's commercial? I heard it on KLTY, the Christian radio station here locally. I don't even think they knew it. I think they just put it up. I think, and, and maybe those Christians that heard it, who knows if they've had any flack. I plan to send a, an email or a letter at least to thank them for not paying attention to that. But maybe if I say something, I might be the only one that says it. I don't know. But we also see that just recently in Detroit, they had such protests that it came out, became so uh, disruptive and so violent that they had a stampede of people running because they thought they heard a gunshot. And they had neo-Nazis with their Nazi flags and Nazi badges on their, sh on their arms, standing there with their signs, being aggressive toward the crowd. What's wrong with this world? It used to be that it just was a fun time to get together with like-minded folks, and now we have to worry about people pushing back and protesting back. It becomes so divisive and so disruptive. There's something wrong with our society. There's something wrong in our churches where still, when a church will still refuse to do a burial for a gay person, or refuses to do weddings, when a, when a Catholic priest will tell them not to do anything with gay pride because that's going to be so hurtful to their children and to themselves, and yet the Catholics have done nothing about the sexual abuse that they've had and the child abuse that they've participated in. It's interesting. And it seems like any time we say something on Facebook or in social media, it almost is like a dog whistle, if you will calling for people to come running, and they run from both sides. You can say something, you feel like it's pretty innocuous, and you, you feel like it doesn't really mean much about it, you're just saving your peace, how much you love your church, or how much uh, this is important, or how, how great it is, and suddenly people are just jumping on you. And you think, what's wrong with people? And they're coming from both sides of the, the political spectrum. And, and, and some people say, well, we're, you know, in the, in the progressive groups, we're, we're, we're hurting ourselves because we're shooting ourselves, not figuratively, not maybe, not literally, but figuratively. We're shooting our own, but yet we see it on both sides, that they find things to pick on each other about. It's almost like you're yelling fire in a crowded movie theater. And everybody just starts running, it's pandemonium. And people, it's, it's each for their own, and they're pushing each other down, and nobody's looking out for each other. And the world is in chaos. And I believe that was what was on the cusp of what was happening there in Jerusalem that day when the Spirit came down. I believe that they were on the cusp of, of a revolution. There was something going on. They had just killed a very pro powerful, favored prophet, Jesus. And some that may only knew him as a prophet, and some assumed he might be the Messiah, and some had some inkling that he might be the Son of God, and some had seen him come back, and some had heard the rumors, but there was something possibly about to happen, and it was going to erupt. And you can see how horrible it could have been if it had gone poorly. How the Romans would have come in there and wiped things out, stamping down this uh, this pieces that were falling apart. And yet the Spirit came through with this loud rush of wind and a flame of fires upon the believers. Now some people assume it was only the disciples that were there, but I've read some other things that it could have been about 120 people crowded in that room together. 
Because it would have been some of the women believers, some of the other believers. Yes, the, the 11 disciples that were still around were there, but it was also possibly another, maybe up to 120 people in that room. And they were all filled, as our reading said, all filled with the Spirit, because they were all together in that one room. And fire was breaking out. But it wasn't a physical fire that was burning thing. It was a spiritual fire. And it was wonderful. Go ahead and show the slide, if you will, Robert. That, um, I came across some pictures recently, and I was reminded of our fire two and a half, uh, three and a half years ago. December 14, 2015. This was the fire department outside of our building right here. Uh, as we had that fire that had started actually on the 13th and uh, Sunday the 13th and it burned all through Monday or smoldered and then ended up being burning on Monday. And then the next picture that's me with the fire inspector uh, inspecting what had happened to that front two rooms and how things had been burned and the ceiling and the smoke damage that was all through this place. And I remember as we that very night, I called folks and, and told them, told some of the deacons what was happening, uh, and we scheduled a meeting that very Tuesday, the next day, to meet together. And some other leadership within the church, we met together. And there was lots of fear, lots of anger, lots of frustration, lots of just, I don't know what to do, We're, we may give up kind of mentality going on. And I felt like God was telling me, Curtis, You've been through many things before. You can do this. Because I, I was feeling a little incapable too. There's a lot on our hands. And, and to hear from our insurance and to, and to worry about the landlord's insurance and all the, what, what the cleanup. And, and some people are like, we're going to go out there and we're going to get to clean it up and we're going to all work ourselves to that. I'm like, first of all, there's not that many of us. And second of all, there's some dangerous chemicals and things in that that are burned and that smoke. We don't need to be messing with that. We don't have the equipment. We don't have the know-how. We certainly don't have the backbone to do that. And yet God brought us through that time. God pushed us forward in so many ways. And wonderful things have happened to us since then. We had gay marriage available to us, for one thing. And immediately we were able to do many marriages within the church. And I was able to do and represent our church for many others outside of our church to help them. We have many people over this past few years coming to our church for the first time. Many of them don't even know the history of our fire. In fact, they didn't even. In fact, when we mentioned it, they're like, "Really?" And it's kind of interesting how that comes across. We've had lots of people maybe come for the first time, and, and maybe it's the first church they've ever been in that's welcoming and affirming and lets them know it doesn't matter who they are. We've had opportunities with benevolence and, and offer people help and assistance with whatever they're having for, for more of their gas cards or our food cards or maybe helping them pay a special bill that maybe the other resources that are available to them just aren't that easy to find. We've been able to do that and keep people sometimes afloat in a, in a world where our economy is still tough. We've had a constant witness as a church. I've done funerals in this very room of people who were never members of our church they were just members somehow in the loose community, but they found out about us, and, and they found out that I might be willing to do a funeral for a person that was different in their gender or different in their sexuality, and I was willing to do it. And we've had some members come from those funerals. We've had many people who are going through substance use and substance recovery find that this is a safe place to be able to talk about that and to get a family and feel that they belong here. And in this year, I believe more than ever, I've been praying that at Pentecost, where bridges are, and differences are, and bridges that divide us, that the bridges are made, where we're able to hear and understand each other, where we can see our community brought together, where where some of the divisiveness in our world is, is put down, and we have a chance to do something about it. But we also see that sometimes people's reactions to trauma in the world, when, when things happen, where, when they feel trauma, there's lots of things that happen. There's a few things, people's general responses, 
first of all, there might be anxiety and fear. And they just don't know what to do in that anxiety and fear. Often they re-experience the trauma and they kind of relive it over and over. And every time they hear a sound or see something that reminds them of that, they experience it. And so you can see that, that somebody's had some kind of trauma and they keep seeing the things on social media or on the news or they hear things that are happening that sort of re-experiencing some of that trauma. Other people might have an increased vigilance. And that might be shown in some things like their impatience or their irritability. Other people just may avoid things altogether and, and, and uh, try to keep away from everything and just shut down. Others have anger, and they have issues about how best to express that anger. So others may have guilt and shame, and they don't know how to deal with that guilt and shame, and it keeps them feeling like they're unworthy. There's grief and depression, and we can see how debilitating that can be for folks. We also see that there's a distorted self-image and distorted how they see the view of the world. And so they, then it makes it hard to trust anybody. There's also possibly sexual dysfunction, that they just don't feel their body doesn't work. Even though they may want to, they, it doesn't work because it doesn't feel safe. And of course, we also know that there's an increased dependency on substances and abuse of those substances. Now, sometimes people can have all those things. All ten of those, and sometimes they can have just one or two. But I believe that the church, not just our church, the church in general, the church in the world, I believe the church is seeing, and I'm seeing two very specific ways that the church is dealing with trauma. And especially progressive churches like ours, when we thought that things were moving toward a particular progressive way, we thought that things were moving to where everybody would have equality, we were thinking that everything was moving that way and that people who were standing against that equality were just moving away and moving into the shadows, and we were moving forward, and now we're seeing that it's not. Even in our own denomination, that MCC denomination, I believe that our denomination is experiencing some of these things. And churches do one of two things, I believe. Either they're overzealous, that increased vigilance, and sometimes they're overzealous about minor things. We see some of the churches today uh, that get so excited and so upset about gay rights or uh, against them or for them, and, and yet they're so divisive about that, they, I believe they forget Jesus. Or I think another thing, and I think maybe this might be what's happening with us, is there's the avoidance, the feeling stunned, there's the shock and the prone to apathy. I believe sometimes people just avoid it. It's, it's just easier not to. I have a little slip in your, in your pew in front of you. It's got today's verse, our portion of today's passage that we read. It's the part that Peter quoted from Joel, and it's that part that I have. And what I'd like for us to do, I'm going to turn off the camera for just a few minutes. We, we've got a few more minutes I'd like for us to do something. But I'd like for us to turn off the camera. And on the back side of that is calling uh, dwelling in the Word. And for, what I'd like for you to do is find a person here in our group that you know the least. Now, you may know everybody, and that's fine. But find somebody you know the least of the least. And I'd like for y'all to read the passage aloud together. Now, this is not your homie and not your not your best bud or, or, or maybe not even a family member or, or, or partner. Just find somebody else to go to, that, somebody you're most familiar with. I'd like for you to read the passage. Then I'd like for you to listen to that person, he or she, how they see that passage in their own words. And then I'd like for you to tell them in your own words. And then I want you to listen to each other on answering one of these two questions. What captured your imagination and what or and or what question would you like to ask a Bible scholar? And then I want you to listen well to that person. It's your job to report what the other person said, not what you felt or said. I want you to be able to be available to report what your partner said. So I'm going to give us about three to four minutes. You'll have about a minute and a half to two minutes apiece to share together, and then I'd like to bring us back together. So I'm going to ask the camera to be turned off for your privacy so that nobody's on the camera that don't want to be on the camera, and then we'll flip it back on to talk just a little bit more. Uh, uh, yeah, disguise your voice. Recording is on. All right.
So we gather back together to talk about some of these things. And so I want to first ask a question. What might God be up to in delivering this passage to us today? And it may have been you heard this from your partner to answer this question. What might God be up to in this passage for us today? Somebody want to share that? My partner mentioned something when she was reading. She said that, and it really caught her imagination, that particular verse that said, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And there's a certain amount of that, you know, no matter what trials or struggles or fearful things might be coming their way, all will call upon the name of the Lord. And she said, and I was thinking of the word all, that was an inclusive word. So that meant something to me. That's yeah. What I, well, I was going to say that was my exact, that's what he said. So what was okay, y'all said all. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, kind of like these are visual warning signs. You know, kind of like, you know, we were talking about today, you know, when the sister says, and the sun signs of the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great glory of the Lord of God. When you think about it, you know, you've got, like, we see back then, you know, it was like, what, the sun turned dark. Today, we're like, oh yeah, there's one in the echo. Right. Um, and then you see where the moon is turned red, but blood red. And you see something like blood and blood fire, and, you know, with the forest fire. The uh, wars and things like that going on, and a lot of smoke with the volcanic activity and stuff. So it, it makes you wonder are these like, signs, you know, like, basically letting you know we are in the latter days that, you know, soon they're going to be able to. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think, and sometimes we're dismissive of some of those signs. Here are the early, those early Christians seeing those things might have been more spurred on toward. Living right with God, but we're sort of dismissive as we see the, the wars and the fires and the struggles and the things. Yeah, all of us are right here. Thank you. Yeah. Who else well, said that? Yeah. I just say it would be kind of scary for right? Scary? Okay. Yeah, scary. My partner and I uh, uh, both uh, caught on to the part where I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young will see visions, and your old will dream dreams. And what was discussed was the fact of those visions and dreams some people might call a psychic feeling, an intuition, a sixth sense. We both felt that that was God's way of letting us know of something that might be happening and where we could be useful doing His work. Okay, so this feeling that God's moving and God's going to be working and yeah. some signs that you're feeling good. Yes. Good. But on that day, All right, so it's not something to be careful of because you're already saved and you're happy. Yeah. 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 Well, how great it would be. Like, yeah. But I think it's one of those things where if you're prepared, and that's the, that's the key right there. If you're prepared, it'll be a very good day for you. If you're not, right. it'll be a very good day. Prepared like that. What do you mean prepared? Spiritual, Spiritual prepared. Spiritual. Yes, Adrian. My point is like, um, on that day, that no more, nothing else can be done to him. You know, you, you, our problem will be gone because God will be there and that will be one of the happiest days of my life. Because she knows that if anything will come up against her, it can't be touched because we'll be, you know, we're in the Lord. Okay, because we're in the Lord and, and all the things that are yeah, abuses and all the struggles. Right, all the struggles. Everything that's happened in the past won't be happening now because we'll be saved. Good God. Good. Good. Somebody else want to share? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, uplifting and gives us hope and clarifying. Uplifting, hope, and clarifying. Good. 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 It's almost like the earth that you think about, like the days of Noah. The earth went through a baptism of water, and maybe now it's more of a baptism of fire. Okay. And, and Christ said that himself, that uh, John the Baptist said, excuse me, that I baptize with water, but uh, he will come with, they'll baptize with fire. And so you're saying that that's sort of the that's feeling of the whole word that same way. Yeah, 
Yeah, because I think we can have our own. You're right. So that's not a, a demonic thing. I mean, we God does give us visions and, and guides us and directs us and stirs something up sometimes. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Thank you. Well, and I, I really felt like I, I got a pal. Also, we were talking in my group. Uh, we were talking a little bit about the young and the old, the, the daughters and the sons, the men and the women, and, and how, you know, sometimes when we're old, um, we feel like we don't have anything else to dream for, or we don't have any more time left, or we're not going to ever have enough money, or we're just not got enough energy to do it anymore. But there's something here that when the spirit moves, it's going to guide you anyway. It's going gonna, it's gonna to motivate you in some ways. And so I, I was excited to see that. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to finish up here just real quick. I appreciate you sharing that. I think sometimes we need to just take a, an analytical view and maybe hear from each other to kind of spur that up in us. I, I realized that and we were quoting, and Peter was quoting Joel too, so I went back to look at Joel and see what was happening. Joel's a very minor prophet. And it's interesting that Peter kind of took this piece of this passage out of all the different things that they would all know. And he took this very minor prophet, somehow he had memorized. And uh, that gets you back to scripture memory. If you haven't done scripture memory, this might be helpful too. But in, in that, I believe that Peter was trying to say a couple of things. Joel 2 starts off with, before this passage you read, that Joel 2 starts off with lots of destruction. That the people were experiencing locusts and coming through and eating up all their crops. And, and how the locusts were like this mighty wind, like a fire burning through their crops. And you can imagine that this was a harvest time that they're talking about. And to hear what the Old Testament folks had experienced when the locusts had come through. And yet this was a moving of God against them because they weren't right with God. And when they realized they weren't right with God, in Joel, they returned to God in repentance. And the Bible says that God heard their prayers. And that God promised restoration toward them and a fullness to them. But not only restoring what they had, not only restoring their lives, but restoring that relationship with God is what God was talking about. And the more that God's promises would be restored, it was this relationship that seemed to be the most important. There was an indwelling of the Spirit that God promised in this passage, and we see it happen in that New Testament time on the day of Pentecost. But we also see it today when people turn to God. When people first find out that you go to a church that might welcome them and the excitement that they feel. And sometimes they're still a little scoffers. Sometimes they're like, that can't be. they got to be crazy. Just like those that were scoffing out Peter and them that they must be drunk. No, this is a spirit movement. And a wonderful promise that's there after all the signs and the wonders, all the possible scary things, all the struggles that you may go through. As someone said... That anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Amen. That's what we're here for. We're to be a church that the Spirit is moving in us, that we're pointing to people to call upon the name of the Lord, no matter what struggles they're going through, no matter what fight that they have in their life, no matter how down and out and feel like they're kicked down they can be, no matter how many Nazi-like people stand against us or anybody, other force that might stand against us, if we call upon the name of the Lord, we will be saved. What a blessedness. I pray that that spirit will continue to move in us. Light up in us a fire that will move us to be a church that is on fire for that. And not calling it out like yelling fire in a crowded theater where people go in pandemonium. But yelling, come to the flame because it's cold out there in the wilderness. Come to the warmth. Come to the campfire. Come to the Spirit moving in our hearts and lives. Let's pray. God, we pray for our denomination. We pray for our church. We pray for other churches like us. We pray for the world, God, that they will see a God that's willing to give your Spirit upon all people, young and old, men and women, gay and straight. That, God, you are moving in mighty ways. And nobody's going to stop your spirit from moving. 
Nobody's going to stop us when your Spirit's guiding us and directing us. Nothing's going to get in the way because we can hold on to the fact that all who will call upon you will be saved. We thank you for this relationship, God, you offer us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen.